can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Ted Lau, and Ted founded BallisticCarts.com. We'll talk all about that. And Ted, before I formally introduce you, I I always like to point out other episodes of the podcast people should check out. Um, There's one episode, or actually two, with Jason Swank. Jason Swank built his agency up to eight figures and sold it. Uh, and then even buying up agencies, he also has an agency group. And that was just interesting to hear his evolution, the agency space, um, valuations. Uh, another good one uh, was Todd Tasky. Todd Tasky basically helps pair private equity with agencies, and he helps sell agencies, and he has a second bite podcast. So because sometimes he found that people who sold to private equity made more on the second bite than they did on the first bite. So that's also an interesting episode um, and many more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships. Uh, how do we do that? We do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the accountability, the strategy, and the full execution. Ted, we call ourselves the magic elves that run around in the background and make it look easy for the host and the company so they can create great content and great relationships. You know, for me, The number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Ted Lau. He's the founder and CEO of Ballistic Arts. And they are a high-touch lead generation digital marketing agency. He looks young, but a couple decades later, he's been running this agency for over 20 years. They focus on online lead generation for established mid-market B2B across North America. And these people, if you think of who they are, they've been frustrated. They're not getting enough new business from their marketing efforts. And that's why people called Ted. And some people call him Obi-Wan Kenobi of this. So past clients include the Business Council of British Columbia, Shift IQ, and they've like 11 pages of more of clients that they even have on their website. And he's also the co-host of the podcast, Marketing News Canada. Ted, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. I know you're not supposed to call you Dr. J, but I had to to do that. Thank you for having me on your show. And yeah, I would love to also just uh, give a shout out to my co-hosts at the Marketing News Canada as well. We have uh, had a few interviews recently. The CMO of Indeed, Jessica Jensen, was a great interview where we talk about the differences between B2B and B2C marketing. And really, at the end of the day, it's B2P. Uh, also, the CMO over at Fight Camp, uh, which is founded by six Canadians and a Bostonian. And they basically raised $90 million to create a fighting app, uh, fitness app. And that was a really great story about how they went from zero to hero. And we also have one, my favorite, is interviewing Colonel Chris Hadfield. He's a Canadian hero astronaut. Mm, And we talk about, you know, what he did in space and what his favorite meal was in space. So if you get a chance. Which was, are you going to reveal it? No, you got to listen to it. It's astronaut ice cream? It is not astronaut ice cream. It is not astronaut ice cream. You'd be surprised what it was. I did not expect that to be the case, but uh, you have to to tune in. (laughs) Nice. I love it. You mentioned, uh, we'll talk about. We're going to talk about B2P for a second, but before we do, just tell people, um, and if they're, you're watching, you're listening to the audio, there is a video version. um, And so you can check this out, but talk just for a second about Ballistic Arts and what you do. Yeah, thank you. So Ballistic Arts, we are a full service lead generation digital marketing agency. As you mentioned, we've been around uh, for 22 years. I started this in the room of above my parents' garage. And yes, thank you for saying that I'm young. You can't see the gray hairs with my, I guess, not very good camera, but we've been around the block and the the folks that we service are mid-market B2B companies who are struggling, trying to find different people for different parts of marketing. They're feeling like they're not getting guidance on their leads. And at the end of the day, they are feeling like their marketing is a waste of money and not getting the ROI. And everything that we do is a, is basically running their entire creative 
sales and marketing funnel from things like top of funnel at PPC, SEO, things like getting your blogs written, short form video, all the way to middle of funnel, landing pages, website creation, and then the conversion point uh, or the bottom of funnel, be it email marketing, fill in and form, remarketing, doing word of mouth 2.0, where we get you a ton of reviews. Ultimately, it's about hitting your sales goals because our clients, what they care about most is the actual return on investment, how much money they're making out of their marketing efforts. We're not here to be fluffy like maybe, you know, Nike or whatnot. Not saying that Nike is, is fluff, but, you know, they have a lot of money and maybe they can experiment on a few more things. Our clients are, you know, trying to put food on the table because they're B2B companies. They just want to see a return. Love it. And so talk about, you know, for a second, why? So you're above your parents. You're, you're at your parents' place. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was what a made you start the agency? Well, uh, that story is a little bit, uh, let's dial it back. So it was, oh, six months after 9-11 or so. Uh, I just came out of school and I was uh, in video production. I actually went to a local school in Vancouver, Canada, where, I, where our head office is. And I wanted to get into film production, movies. Being a child of immigrants, you're supposed to be doctor, lawyer, accountant, whatever that is. And I'm like, ah, I'm not doing that. I'm going to chase my dreams. What were and your parents? What did your parents do? My, 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 my dad worked at the bank. My mother was a at first stay at home mother and then became a real estate agent uh, where so some you know, entrepreneurial. Uh, well, actually, yeah, I think I had a friend of mine, actually a client of mine asked me when I first started the business, he's like, you seem pretty dialed in on, on business. Do you, is it in the blood? And at the time I didn't, even realize, but I look back and on, especially on my mother's side, she has, there's nine siblings and oh. eight out of the nine ended up running their own business. Now they were all sole proprietors, right? A tailor, counselor, uh, import exporter, those kinds of folks. So they kind of just worked for themselves and were self-employed. But I guess I just always knew that I was going to work for myself. In fact, I went a few years ago, I, I went to see a a counselor and he got me to do the, to do this exercise and asked people close around me and said, you know, just to figure out, you know, did they think that you were ever going to be an entrepreneur and what qualities and traits that you needed? And I remember asking my dad, my dad, did, did you ever think when I was growing up, I, I'd be running my own business? And he's like, no, but I knew that you couldn't work for somebody. <laughs> and I'm like, so, so. He's like, you never so, listened to me growing exactly. up. Is that what he's saying? You, you, you never could work for I'm like, so it's either become living on the streets or <laughs> run my own business. And he's like, yeah, pretty much. Right. And so that was kind of what happened. But, but to ask to, to, to your point, why did I start the business? I always knew I wanted to start a business, but I was trying to get a job in Vancouver. It's kind of deemed Hollywood North, a lot of production happens like Deadpool is filmed in Vancouver X-Files and those kind of you know bigger shows and I wanted to get into that but 9-11 happened and everyone lost their jobs there's no not a lot of production all the production went back to LA and I was just trying to make a living I met uh, I started doing a lot of volunteering and I met my uh, former business partner on set at an indie film shoot and we worked really well together and he's like hey do you want to start a business and I was like sure how hard could it be like literally was my thought like how how hard yeah we'll just do that and we kind of played business for the first five six months we built uh we we you know tried to find a name then chose a logo then built a website and when we built the website we were so naive and ignorant about this is the internet back in the early 2000s right we sat back business come business did not come no business to be had and so we had to figure out how we're going to do this. I actually, it was me, him, and another partner. Those two guys were working full-time at the mall at a local photo development shop. And I said, look, if we really want to do this, someone's going to have to do sales. And the both of them said, not it. So, okay, I guess I'm doing it. And I literally just used the Yellow Pages and the book, the Yellow Pages, and just started cold calling. You know, Mondays was restaurants. Tuesdays was plumbing. Thursdays was Wednesdays was with automotive Thursdays was, I don't know, law firms or something like that. And we just, it was dialing for dollars and got hung up a lot and nose and all that. And one brick at a time. Ted, what was hit. working at the time? Cause you learn really quickly, right? Yeah. What people are responding to. What was the niche 
that you found was working and what you were saying what was working because that that's not easy right there's a lot of things that have to happen in a I, cold call i i guess so i think so a few things that i would i would say being a child of immigrants growing up in north america all my friends were were white and they grew up with allowances this thing called allowances i never got such thing called an allowance and so i was always kind of scrounging for extra dollars just to you know buy a pair of sneakers or whatnot and early early on I beg and pleaded my parents to, you know, I, I wanted to get a job, but the legal working age in British Columbia at the time was 15. So I couldn't work. And so my mother, who I, we talked earlier is a realtor, she ended up getting a job for herself in her name and giving it to me. And the job was a cold calling job for a place called Fabricland, where middle-aged to older ladies are buying reams of fabric and then sewing dresses, curtains, drapes, whatever they want to do. And my job was that they printed the stack of dot matrix paper and each line had a name and a phone number. And then for every call I made was 25 cents. And I thought, oh man, I'm going to be rich, right? And the great thing about that was you're calling little old ladies in the 90s. There was no internet. There was 13 channels on television. So they're kind of lonely. And it was great. They were super friendly. Oh, so nice young man calling me. And in fact, we got on so well with a lot of these calls. I had to tell them, oh, I have to go now because you know I'm making a quarter. <laughs> you should have been charging them at the time. I, I, I think there was a business there. I was talking to someone like having a like an elderly person having a friend, you yeah. know. So you could have been charging them. Actually, after five minutes, I'm charging you a dollar a minute. Exactly. I should have done that. But it was a really warm experience i have to say it was very friendly and i made mm. a bit of money on it so, so you associated when, it with positive experiences not negative and yeah. were you did they give you any training or did they just hand you oh, the ream of paper they gave and like, me the ream of paper and then there was a on on a piece of paper they gave you a script that you had to read like you know hey uh next saturday is our fabric land spring sale and da, 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 and say stuff but because it was kind of boring i would kind of I'm a creative type and I get bored with the same, same all the time. If I just said this thing, you know, 80,000 times, I'd get bored. So I'd make stuff up or not make stuff up like it's a different sale, but I would just put a little bit of flour on it or, you know, whatever flourish and just had a little bit more fun. And it was, it was an enjoyable experience. And I just, I think for the fact that, oh man, I, I can make money doing this. This is fantastic. I don't have to do hard labor. I'm just literally picking up the phone and using my mouth and saying words, and now I'm getting paid. And then my subsequent jobs in high school were selling computers at Staples or printers at Staples and selling sneakers at Sport Check and stuff like that. That's really kind of my experience with sales. And so when those two guys, my former partners said, you know, I don't want to do sales because uh, scary dude, sales. I was like, I'll do it. And, you know, at the end of the day, starting a business Anyone can start a business, but that's a hobby until you make money. And so that was the, the, I guess, thought process that I had in my head. Even our name, people ask me all the time, why is your company called Ballistic Arts? And it's not a, being a creative company, it's a not very good creative story. It was, we were sitting around for months trying to come up with a name. How about this name? No, how about this name? Uh, all this kind of stuff. And I just got sick of it. I'm like, again, until we start making money, it's not a real business. So one of the guys had an email handle that was ballistic with a Z arts, with a Z or something like that at hotmail.com. I'm like, screw it. We're just going to use that name. And if we don't like it, we'll change it later if we make any money. I'm not going to waste any more time trying to figure out a name and let's just go. Same thing with our logo and whatnot. It was just, we're going to figure it out as we go. Kind of building the plane while you fly it. That's kind of been my motto, my whole career. And, and what's we just, been a, a milestone of a client? Maybe it was a, a early on first client. client? Now you're doing all these calls. Yeah, go ahead. Two. I have two. One was uh, a restaurant chain, an Italian restaurant chain that no longer exists, but we they were fairly big in the suburbs of Vancouver. They had five or six different restaurants. And I remember going to one of their establishments and it was actually a spinoff. It wasn't a traditional Italian restaurant. It was a 
Fusion was really big back then. So there was a Italian Asian fusion restaurant. And I went there in my early twenties, having drinks and food with some friends. I really liked the food and I might've had a few drinks. So I gave my business card to the man, the, the guy at the door, like, Hey, tell the manager, I really like the food. That's it. And I found out nine months later that that doorman person was actually the younger brother of one of the, what the, of the owner. And he had been following our website and seeing our progress. And he called me. I remember I was getting into an elevator at what I was doing. Like I would do door to door cold calling too, like knocking on doors, like going to office buildings and just going from like the 20th floor and walking all the way down, 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 and just knocking on doors. And I remember getting into the elevator and I get a phone call and I didn't know who this was, but I saw the name of the restaurant. I'm like, what the hell? So I call and I picked up the phone. The guy's like, Hey, I need some help. Da, da, da. So I go down to meet them. And this was, you're asking me like, how do you get started? We started as a video production company. This client was like, I don't need video. I only have, t- I only have TVs in my restaurants, but I need some menus designed and I like your design work. Can you design me menus and brochures and whatnot? And I was like, <laughs> yes, yes, I can. Cause I was hungry. I was trying to, trying to get business. And then a couple of months later, it was like, Hey, uh, this website thing, it's not going away. Is it? No. Can you build me a website? And it was kind of just get in where you fit in. And then there was a lot of networking, but it was just bootstrapping it. And cold calling was the cheapest form of marketing that we could do. That's why we did it. That was the first story. And the second story was uh, one of my, so my sister's best friend, still to this day, her brother worked at a large financial institution. And uh, you know he gave us a call and this was when digital video was just starting out. And he wanted to do something different to impress the CEO. And we did this little video shoot uh, for a grand opening of a branch that they had. And the video was super tiny. It was like four and a half megs that they put on a website. I don't know what they did with it. CEO, that guy, the CEO of this, this institution, he was one of um, Canada's most powerful uh, business leaders. He took to me. He was just like, this young guy kind of seems to really want to try things out. And he really liked me. And he had creative ideas, but his marketing team wouldn't let him do a lot of his crazy side projects and pay their expensive agency. So they're like, oh, let's call Ted. And so I got to basically sit in the boardroom of one of uh, the area's largest banks or as a credit union and learn kind of business. And as I'm interviewing people and whatnot, and just getting that. And I got to pick his brain all the time, asking him like 20 questions. And the fact that I think I was young it and, and showed enthusiasm, people just wanted to help and just, yeah. And, feed me with lots of knowledge. And one thing led to another. And here we are today. Ted, one of the things, um, you know, I know back then you were focused on different things than now. And now it's building leaders, it's building the team as you've grown. Um, Talk about the evolution a little bit of of hiring. First, it's you, you have two co-founders. What happens next? Oh, man. Okay. So first, uh, there was three of us and within six months, the one guy didn't want to do it anymore. And so we had $300 in the bank. We gave him a hundred dollars and said, see, <laughs> right. And that was, that was it. That was the buyout. At the time. That was the buyout. That was the buyout. There was no earnout period at all. And so we, anyway, so we, on the hiring side, quite frankly, the, the first, <laughs> is going to sound terrible. The first hire was my girlfriend. Uh, who is now my wife of, uh, you know, we've been married. Well, we've been together since 99. We've been Good married. thing it worked out. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. so she, we were dating and we went to school together in, in communication studies. And she did uh, magazine publishing. But as we all know, magazine publishing, if, while it was still big back then, it was, it was the beginning of the end. So she, she kind of started into the industry as the peak was over. So she was very frustrated and deflated. Saying, you know, she was working for three publications and was barely making more than a barista at Starbucks. And so she was really deflated. And I'm like, well, if you're going to make garbage money, you might as well work for me. And she was like, okay. <laughs> That's a great sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> and it was I can give you garbage money. Come I can on. give you garbage. Well, if, you, if you're going to do that, might as well help me build this thing. Because we, I'm a, I'm a pretty... Uh, one track minded individual. So I think it just communicated that like, I'm here for the long haul. So, you know, babe, if you want to, you want to play, let's do this. And so she was like, yeah. And so she came on 
and basically did all the work that I didn't want to do, like web programming. I didn't like doing. So we trained her in web programming, uh, invoicing and whatnot. So that was the, the first role, but the first couple of real roles were I was speaking uh, to my alma mater and one of the co-op kids came up and said, Hey, I'm looking for a job, a co-op job, uh, between semesters. Uh, are you hiring? And we were in fact hiring. So we brought that person on and then we hired a, a graphic designer and we were still working out of the basement uh, in my in my house. Uh, I was married by then, when, when, but went to my girlfriend who's, you know, became my wife. And so he'd knocked on the door, the job interview was in my basement and stuff like that. And at the time it was very much, do you know this software program? Do you have a nice portfolio? And you, will you work for this little money? And that was, you know, sit on down. And then I started taking a program called EO Accelerator. So Entrepreneurs Organization yeah. is a global organization. I joined their accelerator program many, 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 many years yeah. ago. I'm in EO Chicago. Love, love the organization. Oh, yeah. man. Fantastic. So yeah, I actually ended up becoming the accelerator chair. But in any case, when I was in accelerator, uh, one of the speakers said, you know, core values, talk about core values and how important core values are for your organization. And I remember thinking, like, I have four people in my company. What, what do I care about core values? Why is that important? And you're pulling up here our core values. And he said, Ted, you have four people. If one of them is not a fit because of your core values and they leave or they're dragging along, that's 25% of your workforce. And that opened my eyes. And I immediately started digging into the core values, how to build core values. And we used the Jim Collins, good, great. He had a PDF, I think you can search for it still, called Mission to Mars. And it was just this exercise. And I remember sitting down in my boardroom table in my um, little office and just started building my core values. And uh, that's how we kind of went. And, and, and it's kind of evolved and changed over time. But these, these core values that you're showing, continuous improvement, radical candor, cause and effect, and determination. These are like, we live and breathe these. And that's really helped create a filter for us to hire folks that will then, maybe they have varying interests and whatnot. There you go. Uh, varying interests. For those that are listening, um, Jeremy just pulled up the Mars Group PDF on jimcollins.com. Yeah, jimcollins.com. You can see the Mars Group and there's a, a nice framework here. You want to check it out. Yeah, it's a great framework. I used that, built it out. And essentially, core. what I love about core values was, I remember, again, we'll, we'll go back to my wife. When we were dating, you know, I was into like punk rock and industrial music and partying. And my, my wife was kind of a, a more quiet, Mariah Carey listening kind of individual. And we had nothing in common whatsoever. Other than like Chinese food, we had nothing in common. Yet, we really got along. And one of my clients actually i was telling her about this she's like your core values you guys have similar core values and when i realized that you can have varying interests but if you have similar core values as humans you're going to make a great team and that's really how we hire and fire this is for both clients and staff and over the over time we've gotten better at it uh we're still not great at it in fact i launched a youtube video recently uh, called You Know Ted. And if you go to YouTube, it's at You Know Ted Lau. And one of the videos I talk about is some of the mistakes I've made in hiring and even recently. Because just because you know this is how you're supposed to do it, sometimes desperate desperate situations come on. And you're like, I don't, I, I'm just going to hire the person and then realize, oh man, I made a mistake. When it comes to leaders though, that has been a bit of a journey. And it's we found that hiring within has really helped. We're a small company. We're not, we're still under 30 folks and having people that maybe started at the production level, then became a project manager and then bring them up and becoming a department head has really gone a long way to build the loyalty, to build the culture because others then see, Hey, there's a path for my own success. And because this is one of us, not leadership that is coming in and running a particular department has, I think created leadership inherently in varying roles that doesn't depend on leadership, the leadership team itself to, it's not coming top down, it's coming, you know, bottom up. So that's been a, a real, real journey. What was a key position that you put in place? Because it's you, 
there's there's three of you, then there's two of you, then it's your girlfriend, and then you have someone coming from the college. But um, what was the, the uh, kind of I don't know, I don't know what you call it. Um, you got out of the awkward teenage stage into you know way more the mature stage. What was a key position there um, that kind of took to help take you to the next level? Uh, the management level it was a big one. And it was, it took us many years of growing pains. First, it was just project management. We had a lot of technicians that were hands on keyboard, but ultimately we didn't have managers to run projects properly. And that learning curve was, it was a lot of, you know, peaks and valleys of, of figuring that out. Um, but then after I bought out my partner and really understanding, and, and we were talking about EOS uh, earlier in the pre-call entrepreneurs operate operating system. Uh, there's a book out there by Gino Wickman called Traction. I'm sure you've talked about it in other uh, episodes. That that book really helped us understand we got to have the right butts in the right seats and and making sure that we're bringing on and, and visualizing what the org chart's going to look like in the future and then start slotting people in. That has really helped us understand this. If we're going to grow here, in the next three or four years, we're going to need this position. And this is what it's going to need to be. And ultimately, understanding that we need to have not just managers that can run departments, but have instill leadership qualities in them. So uh, on top of our core values, we have uh, three things that we call our company mindset. I guess in a way, they're kind of like core values, but it's how we do business, not just the how we live life. And they come from a, a leadership program that me and one of my advisors had taken. And one is 100% responsibility. So it doesn't really matter if you come into a situation and you didn't cause the issue. The 100% responsibility is what can I do in this particular situation to make this better? That's one. Another one is workability. So rather than blaming, because it's very easy when you know, poop hits the fan, fingers point, not to me, point to other folks, because blame is easier than taking response, responsibility. So first we have 100% responsibility, then we have workability where it's like, what's workable? Culture of no blame, there's no right or wrong. Again, this is the situation, where do we go from here to make this situation work for everybody? And not just for the client, for the team, for the individual, everybody. And then the last company mindset is, is what we call integrity, but in a way where it's like doing what you say you're going to do, doing it on time, doing what you say you're going to do, even when others don't expect you, didn't say it, but expect you to do it and do it and on time and the way that's supposed to be. Those are three critical things that we talk about all the time, almost on a weekly basis, and actually on a weekly basis. And it's, it's really helped elevate the team and it it, we're in a situation, we're blessed to be in a situation where I can spend a lot of time talking to you about this stuff and leaving my team doing their thing. It's a very self-managed company at this point. What was the, and I love, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. What was the leadership program it called? It also reminds me of, you know, one of my favorite books, The Four Agreements. Um, yeah, similar. Very similar, which is like they talk about be impeccable with your word, do not take anything personally, don't make assumption, always do your best. But the be impeccable with your word reminds me of the integrity piece, which is like you just do your best to say, do what you said you're going to do. You know what I mean? Um, what was the leadership program called? The leadership right? program was actually a self improvement program oh. that one of my my coaches slash mentors told me to take. I was going through, I was starting to go through the divorcing period with my former business partner. I, at the time, I didn't know. We were just having static and the business model wasn't working. I, I just wasn't happy. And so he got me to go to this because he he was like, it's not, again, not that, that person's fault. Like, sure, you and your partner don't like each other, but it's not all him. Like, what are you responsible for? And he took me uh, to this program. It's called Landmark. I've heard of it. Yeah. Heard of yeah. It. And it, uh, it's a professional, it's like a personal development program where I, I took it and I actually did a lot of their leadership training. They had a program called the self-expression and leadership program that I took and became a coach on, which was a lot of, it was actually a lot of fun. However, I wouldn't be saying that I'm a proponent necessarily of 
the culture that Landmark had started to instill over the time I was there. However, you know, as, as my mother would say, always take, you know, the good out of any situation. So there was a lot of good out of that program that I benefited from, I benefited from that I instilled into my company. And there was a lot of things that I definitely didn't agree with, with the organization. So um, I've, I've since it's been like eight you, years. You know, you took the good and threw out the, the stuff you didn't exactly. agree with. Exactly. How did you, you know, from the business partner perspective, um, how did you navigate buying out your partner? Oh, <laughs> I don't know if navigate is the word that I would use. Uh, <laughs> fumble, stumble, <laughs> you know, fall on my face is kind of how I would say it. Um, so I said earlier, I was part of EO entrepreneurs organization. And I joined through the accelerator program to kind of grow the business and get qualified into EO. And, but I had this weird conception in my head, misconception that when I get into EO, I've, I've arrived and they're going to help me figure out how I'm going to fix my business problems and fix my business marriage as it were. And that is in fact, not what EO is about. But I had this misconception. And when that, when, when the problems that kept arising with my partner happened and they couldn't solve it, I ended up leaving and trying to go out, go on it on my own, trying to figure it out. Did not, did not work. And we got into progressively louder and more disgruntled disagreements that we had a fairly cost-effective office space where the walls were thin. And our voices were loud. And so when the kids start hearing the parents are yelling and screaming, it's not, it's not a good culture. If you go on Glassdoor, you'll see all the one-star Glassdoor reviews I have from that time, five-ish, six years ago. And so it was, it was not fun. And in fact, I, didn't, I wasn't the one that initiated the breakup. It was my partner that wrote me a kind of a Dear John letter. And uh, it, was, it was at first kind of relieving it was a bit of a sense of oh i guess it's like that someone took the lid off the pressure of of that that you know pressure cooker and it was it was him and i thought oh perfect that's not gonna be a problem uh you know i did all the sales anyway he did the operations and if we systematize the operations get them out it'll be fine and I was ignorant to the fact that we did not have the systems in play that I thought we had. And so when I bought him out and he left, then people were like, well, what am I supposed to do with this part of my job? I'm like, what? You, you don't know? Like, I thought there was a system for this. No, it's in his head. And it like every part of the company required this linchpin, as it were, to function. So the company now is all of a sudden this house of cards that are slowly falling down. And I go through 80% turnover. I'm trying to shift the business. We're not a recurring revenue business at the time. We were a four per project business. We weren't doing lead gen. We were just a service business building websites, videos, and branding. And it was, it was, a, it was a, a cluster F an S show. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear in here, but it was all of that and more. My marriage had issues. I was getting sued. Like it was just disastrous. And uh, over that time, I, I reached out to a large network of folks uh, that I know. And everyone, I think just over the number of years of being in the business world, everyone really wanted to help. So I got a lot of advice from varying people. I even called uh, some some agency owners that I looked up to that were much larger, but I knew that they had bur crashed and burned. And I went and talked to them. I went, I talked to people that actually went bankrupt and people that folded their businesses, people that went through the tough time and trying to figure it out. And ultimately, uh, it was it was finally we were we were actually this close to to closing down the company. It was uh, July of nineteen. I thought I was I was done. I was like, I'm just, I can't do this anymore. We were losing like, for us as a, a small business, we we're like losing 50 grand a month for months on end. And that was for us a, a ton of money at the time. And I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't handle this pressure. And uh, I was, I was convincing my wife to, to, to turn it down. And we'd been talking about this for turn it off. We've been talking about this for like two, three, four months at the time, at that time. And she was sick of hearing it. In fact, she's like, okay, either we're going to do it or we're not. And when the final decision of like, okay, we're going to do this, 
she very quietly said, I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to lose this. And at the time she was simply the bookkeeper in the company. She said, I don't, I don't want to lose this. And I was like, well, what do you mean you don't want to lose this? Is, you don't want to lose the lifestyle? Cause like, I can't work for another five, 10 years of this. I want to murder myself. It's not going to be good. And she's like, no, like you built this. And I don't think that it's, it's a good idea. Just let it go. And I remember thinking, well, look, if you're saying that you're willing to like partner up with me and kind of help me on the leadership side and figure it out, okay, well, what do we got to lose? And we had a really long heart to heart about it. And she said, yeah. And so she took it on the helm of HR, have no experience in HR and just kind of helped me along and brick at a time and just step at a time. We, at the, uh, two months prior to that, I had promised I delayed our quarterly meetings with my team uh, because I didn't know what I was going to do, what the direction of the company was going to be. And I just kind of, after having beers with some clients and they convinced me that they wanted me to get into social media marketing. And I'm like, I hate social media. They're like, I'm like, why do you want me to do that? They're like, well, we don't get all any business from our digital marketing. And I'm like, you pay people thousands of dollars a month and you don't get any business from it. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, well, what if I got you leads? Like, you know, drinking a bit. And I'm like, what if I just got you business? Like, wouldn't that be a, a lot easier? And they're like, if you did that, Ted, I'll never leave you. One client actually said that, who's a client of ours today. And so I went on this journey of like, am I sh like half thinking I'm going to shut down this business, but okay, maybe I got to, I can turn this around if I create this digital marketing lead gen program for my business. And as I was thinking, I can't do this, the plan's going to end. And uh, she was like, no, let's, let's do this. I needed, I needed someone to be able to be in my corner uh, because I was being attacked. It felt like anyway, on, on all sides, staff, clients, vendors, whatever you, what have you, former business partner. And uh, she was like, yeah, let's do this. And one thing led to another. And we, we got one client that was convinced that we could help them get leads, second client, third client. Uh, it was, I started that department with half a body. It was actually my video producer who actually worked at another digital marketing agency. Didn't really understand the lead part of it, but I created a plan and I'm like, if you follow this plan, can you do it? And he's like, yeah, I can do this. It was only one client. He had like eight, 10 different video projects, but yeah, I'll do this on the side of my desk and built it from there, built the department. And then now this is like 60, 70% of our, probably 70 some odd percent of our, our business now. And we still do a lot of the creative work and that actually helps the the digital marketing side and it's uh we're in a lot better place but man it was it was it was dark times ted thank you for sharing that and being so vulnerable i think anyone who's been in business has experienced a some spectrum of everything you've talked about um so i appreciate you sharing that and it's amazing how you rebuilt it from the ground up, from probably a staff and service perspective. And so um, thanks for, for, for sharing that. The, I have one last question and just to highlight a little bit about that your methodology and what you do and even the transition to what you do now as a company. Um, let's talk about Eco Raster and, and what you did with them. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Thank you. So Eco Raster is a, um, actually, the company is called Purist North America. So they have a license to sell this permeable paving product all over North America. And this permeable paving product is a kind of unique product. It looks like, for those of you listening, I'll describe it. It looks like a 10 by 10 grid where, you know, if you go to the farmer's market, yeah, it is right here. Potatoes, yeah, these, these kind of grids, this you put into the ground and it helps rainwater go through all the way to the ground so that you don't have floods. Like in California last year, there was a, a rainstorm and then there's all these floods because they don't have a way to um, disperse the rainwater. This client uh, has a full license of the, the manufacturers out of Germany and they, they can market this all, all through North America. And they actually do a bit of manufacturing now in Ontario as well. They came to us because they heard we do B2B lead generation uh, marketing. And they have a distribution network where their distributors, the only way that they're going to play ball and push this product into their clientele base is that they they see that leads are coming through, that it's it, there's an incentive for them to push it. It makes it easier for them. And they were working with another agency that they had been for a while, but 
a lot of agencies that we talk about, it's, it's the kind of nice thing. It's the fluff. I'll get you likes. I'll get you followers. You know, I'll build you a new website. Vanity they were, metrics. Oh, yeah, there was no vanity metrics. There were no, there was no line of sight as to how we're going to do all this marketing and turn it into actual qualified leads that then are distributors in California, in Utah, in Washington, in Texas, and in Boston or, or New York or wherever is going to be able to take these leads and convert it into business. And so when we talked to them, they really looked for a relationship of, of a company that they can work with long term, that can have proof in the pudding. We measure all of our metrics and we manage the entire funnel. It's very turnkey. We go from top of funnel. That's the you know content writing the for blogs and SEO, PPC, a pay-per-click. We do all the design work as well. Uh, maybe some mini videos and then the middle of funnels, the landing pages, website conversion rates, all that kind of stuff. And all the way to bottom of funnel for email marketing and referrals and whatnot. And it's gone extremely well that that particular client, like they, all of our clients will give us a goal. We work with them on how many leads they, they need. And that goal, how many leads they need basically um, it's correlated to how much business that they would get from it. And so that number is what they set. And we've been extremely, uh, I've been extremely proud of my team because we've been able to hit a thousand, sometimes 1600% above their lead target that they set. So they're happy. We're happy. It's a great relationship. And it's because it's built on this foundation of trust and the fact that we are accountable if the results are there, it's us. But if the results, the results aren't there, it's also us. Our entire team at Ballistic Arts Sure, we you know pay them a, a fair wage, but the bonuses that we provide, it's it's fairly generous and it's all incentive based. You hit their client's goals, it's either on track or off track. There's no in the middle. Is it red or is it green? If it's green, you're good. If it's not, there's, there's a problem. And every week, actually right after this meeting today, I meet with all my account managers and we go through green, red, green, red. And anyone that's red, we got to figure out how from a workability standpoint to make it green. And if it's all green, which actually, um, for the first time in a long time, it's been, I think we have one red out of all of our clients. Everyone else is green. That's a good thing. And uh, everyone's happy and clients are happy. We're happy. I love it. Ted, yeah, I just want to be the first one to thank you. Thanks for opening up, sharing your journey, your stories. Everyone can learn from this, myself definitely included. And um, I want to encourage everyone to check out ballisticarts.com to learn more and poke around their site and more episodes of the podcast. And Ted, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jeremy. We'll be, we'll be talking soon. Thanks, everybody. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. Seems like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.